At the end of your life, what will be your legacy? What will you leave behind for future generations? For the world, join the world messenger, Isabella Lundberg, each week as she brings you a new distinguished guest from the business, sports, or entertainment world to share their success, their struggles, and their lessons. They will share their insights into current hot topics that affect everyone. Isabella facilitates an intimate, vulnerable environment to find the true value of humanity and real leadership. Are you ready for your legacy? The legacy that matters? Hello, hello, my beautiful friends. It's Isabella Lombic here, the world messenger, and I'm inviting you for another epic episode of Legacy Leader Show. Today, I have someone that is, I absolutely admire, I have to say, and put his life in line to do so much, um, not only for our country and in this country, but outside uh, through service. Uh, he's a former White House medical officer. He has served three times in Afghanistan and putting his life in danger, uh, but also learned amazing lessons that I cannot wait for him to share here with us. He's, of course, also a phenomenal scholar, a global health professional, great husband and father, and someone who continues to look at avenues to positively impact through his knowledge uh, people around the globe, specifically who cannot get a more advice and more opportunity to learn from phenomenal health professional, right? Without further ado, let me introduce you to Bernard Tony Jr. Bernard, welcome to Legacy Leader Show. Isabella, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. It's greatly appreciated. Absolutely. Thank you, first of all, for your service and everything that you did and continue to do. Uh, to make our nation safe and also to really influence and impact choices, decisions, uh, not only in healthcare space, but obviously around people, everything related to people, as well as obviously uh, related to safety and to um, our country and countries around the world. So do you mind before we go and deep dive in, how did you even decided to go in medical profession? Who influenced you in that decision and how that played for you? Well, you know, I, I think everyone has different ideas when, uh, when they are deciding what they want to do when they grow up. Um, for me, I had absolutely no idea what I wanted to do when I grew up. Um, I grew up in a very distant, very marginalized society, um, uh, poorer neighborhood on the on the spectrum, the lower middle income country, uh, lower middle income neighborhood rather. Um, and so, what what prompted me to go into medicine was ironically on the heels of trauma, um, personal trauma. Um, and I could certainly go into that if you would like me to. But it it wasn't this idea that I was a little boy and I saw you know people in scrubs walking through hospitals and saving people, and I said that's what I want to do one day. It was more so um, uh, on the heels of trauma when I was a teenager uh, before joining the military. That was sort of the impetus for me to want to be in a position to help people that otherwise couldn't help themselves. Wow. Yes, we'd love to hear a little bit more about that and specifically where exactly in parts of this beautiful country you did grow up, because I know that um, even though geographically uh, on the surface, things look different versus when we are in the midst of them and when we experience them. Uh, so please share for audience specifically for the ones that are listening that are outside of the United States and don't have idea how that just looked maybe 20, 30 years ago, not long ago, right? Right. So, um, you know, for, for your audience members, I think that it's it's pretty uh, telling how, how bad gun violence is in many parts of the country. Um, we experience mass shootings. Um, we've become sort of agnostic to the fact that we have so much gun violence and it's become ordinary for a lot of us. Uh, that was the type of trauma that I experienced when I was 17 years old. Um, I was um, just graduating high school and getting ready to join the army. This was, I'm going to date myself here, but this is March of 1999. And I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia, and I was with my with my friend, uh, friends, if you will. So it was uh, three of us in my car. And we went to a gas station after a party, at, after a, a club event, and we uh, were having such a good time. Uh, and as we go to a gas station in the metro Atlanta area, uh, shots started to ring out um, and bullets started to fly. And many of those bullets started to move towards my car and started to hit my car while I was in it. Um, and so I started driving uh, away with my three friends in the car. My good friend, Ivan Gray, um, was in the front seat on the passenger side. And, and unfortunately, he, he was shot in the chest. Um, I believe the bullet went through his back and came out through the front of his chest. 
Um, and at that moment, I didn't know exactly what to do. I drove about a mile or two down the road. I pulled him out of the car. Um, and I remember um, thinking that it was all of a joke. I, I didn't think that he was actually hit by a bullet until he leaned over into my hand and, um, and blood started to pull from his mouth onto my hand. Um, that's when I knew that this was real. Uh, and so after I get, get him out of the car, um, I have all of my friends around me, um, two of my other friends who were there as well in the back seat, and they were saying, don't let him go to sleep, save him, you know, don't let him go to sleep. And as he starts to shake and tremble, I mean, his eyes started to roll. Um, I realized that we were in dire straits, so I called 911. It took them, in my opinion, an inordinate amount of time to get there. It felt like it was, you know, hours. Maybe that was just the experience. Um, but nonetheless, once they got there, um, I believe he was already dead. And so um, he died with me trying to figure out how to save him physically, trying to figure out how to bring resources to bear, that being EMS, emergency medical services. Um, but I wasn't able to. And it was probably the most vulnerable uh, position I've ever been in my life. Um, and in that moment, I wanted to save him, but I couldn't. And I told myself from that point on, that if I were ever in a position to need to save someone, that I would have the skills to be able to do so. Mm, wow. How powerful that is, Bernard. And, and I can relate to similar situation and how helpless you feel. And you write how those seconds turn into hours and, and feel like forever, eternity, till you get skilled help. And then sometimes you wonder, could I, could I save him? Was I able to fight it something different? And later on, of course, with more knowledge now, being a professional doctor and be able to understand that better, it's always a sense of guilt and remorse, isn't it? It is. You know, it sits with you. Um, and I'm a PA by training, but it's, it, it, it sits with you as, you know, for many years, I didn't realize there was nothing that I could do in a situation. Um, you know, in hindsight, um, I believe he probably had attention to pneumothorax, and I believe that, you know, that bullet probably struck some critical organs, um, that there was nothing that I would have been been able to do in the instant. But, you know, looking back, it did, you know, I, I, I did wish that I was able to, you know, could I have driven him to the hospital, you know, as opposed to waiting on the side of the road for, you know, 20, 30 minutes. Um, could I have done anything else? Could I have called 911 sooner? So all of these things that I, that I, um, that I struggled through over the years, I wonder if I was able to do something. In hindsight, I've sort of reconciled, um, you know, those feelings, and, and I've come to the conclusion that there was not likely anything that I could have done. But from move, from from that point moving forward, my idea was is that um, with a large array of skills um, that I've accumulated over the years, I've been entrusted to do the same thing. If I needed to save the president of the United States, I will have the skills to be able to do so. And that is where really is the very powerful uh, moment, obviously, just to be selected. And I know how rigorous selection it is to even remotely be considered to be part of the White House uh, staff and be in such a delicate capacity and to be the White House medical officer in charge in case if something happens to president or anybody in the White House while you're there on the duty. Could you tell us how that unfolded for you and uh, uh, what do you have to go and undergo? Uh, because a lot of people don't have an idea um, how important that level of service is and how tremendous accomplishment that is. And I, first of all, I just want to kudo you, Bernard, for um, finding your path, unfortunately, through traumatic experience, but also sharing a little bit how it was to live in Atlanta during the time. Do you mind sharing also a little bit about that as well and how you foresee current state in our country and, and around specifically in Atlanta right now? Yeah, well, I can say that Atlanta is like many other major uh, cities within our country, right? So if you go to Baltimore, if you go to Los Angeles, you'll find uh, parts of those cities that are much like the way that I grew up in. Um, and unfortunately, in those situations, there isn't a lot for people who are in the marginalized um, portions of the city, people who are poorer, people who have less resources, um, people who uh, don't have both parents in the home, or maybe they're not raised by their parents at all. 
um, those were the environmental factors that I was exposed to growing up. And you really don't have a model to, to base anything off of. You know, I remember, and I'm joking about this, but I remember wanting to be like the local drug dealers, you know, because they were the guys that had a nice car. They seemed to be the guys that had a money, money amongst everyone else who didn't. You know, and so there wasn't a there wasn't an idea that I can somehow practice medicine or lead organizations or work for the White House. None of those things were fathomable um, when I was growing up. And so in those areas during that time, I can tell you that people don't have a lot to look forward to. And so we look forward to um, to the things that are glorified, um, you know, through rap music or through, you know, through things that um, that are nefarious in a lot of ways. Um, we look for glorification in places where we think that we're able to find relative acceptance and success. Um, but that doesn't mean that we're actually doing anything good for ourselves or for our community. And I would venture to say that those elements still exist in many uh, cities to include Atlanta. Um, most recently, I looked on greatschools.org to see what my elementary school was rated as um, to see how well is it performing now compared to when I was an elementary school student. And it's a one out of 10 school. It is the lowest rating that you can possibly have um, for a school in the state of Georgia. Um, and that's, that's not because of just teachers or just the students. There are so many structural elements there. There's um, taxes or what pay for public school systems. And so if you're not generating a lot of income around uh, those schools, then they suffer. Um, it's hard to recruit good talent when things are unsafe. You know, if kids are getting shot, if there's drugs. So it's, it's, there's a confluence of variables and factors that, um, that go into um, those types of environments. But the point that I'm making is, is not a lot has changed in many of those areas, unfortunately. I'm so sorry to hear that. And right now, as I'm listening to you speak, we had an opportunity to reflect of Martin Luther King birthday and in January to celebrate him as a national holiday. Uh, right now, we are into um, Black uh, History Month, right? And then we're really mm -hmm. looking how that looks like in the landscape of our country and nation. And we see decades um, and decades repetition in a way where we fortunately are not um, seeing much of change. And this is also a great opportunity for everybody watching and listening. Change start with us and we have to do better when we know more, when we hear what Brent, uh, I'm sorry, Bernard had to go through and how he's seeing things even today. I'm sure that you have a lot of concern as a father yourself and to look at where, where we headed and also create opportunity for us to really uh, speak up and, and then do something, whatever we can, that can really make that needed transformation and change specifically around education and future generations of leaders. Uh, so with that in mind, everything you've been doing, obviously it's been extremely um, impossible, I'm sure, not only to you, but everybody <laughs> in your community. So how did you navigate that transformation and mindset within yourself to get to be obviously the White House medical officer. Yeah, I will tell you that it, it seems like it's a, it's a, thank you for the question, it's a great question because, um, you know, a lot of people have a hard time connecting the pieces, you know, growing up in, in, a, in a poor area, we'll call it, you know, colloquially the hood, um, and then somehow ended up in the White House. It's not a straight line trajectory. Um, there was, you know, as you can imagine, I was suffering through a lot of trauma coming out of that uh, drive-by shooting, but I was in the army just three weeks later. This was the end of March uh, of 20, uh, 1999, and I was uh, in basic combat training by the uh, by April 19th of 1999. So just about three and a half weeks later. What's interesting is is that um, as I was going through um, all of these changes, as I was going through um, some of these challenges, I didn't have a lot of confidence in myself, and I did have people who invested in me very early. I did have people who saw something in me that I didn't see in myself, which is what I advocate for now is I advocate for leaders to look deep into their organizations and find talent where sometimes people don't feel like they're talented and find skill and ability and potential where people don't feel like they have that skill uh, or ability. And so what I've 
learned over the years is that it took me about five years or so um, since I joined the Army. I joined at 17, so I was not even an adult. I was still a minor uh, when I joined the military. It took me about until I was about 22 or 23 uh, with several bumps in the road to realize that maybe I do have some potential. And I started changing my mindset once I had people that saw something in me other than this kid with gold teeth and um, and tattoos and you know all of these different things that, that don't look professional. Um, but I had people who saw something in me that maybe I didn't see myself. And so that started early on and it was just a ripple effect of over the years, I just continued to have more and more people who saw something in me. Mm, that is beautiful. When we see the value in others, we need to share. And then also when we have opportunity, we have a chance to mentor and groom and help others to really get to that level uh, to unfold their potential instead of trying to suppress it and oppress it and uh, the meaning um, of, of, of that potential, which unfortunately we see here now everywhere, not only in our country, but at other parts of the world. And I'm, I'm sure through that trajectory, um, going in foreign lands and seeing and experiencing the war matures you more than anything else. Since both of us experience wars, we can really kind of make that statement. And do you mind just sharing what that experience was for, for like for you? Yeah, so uh, the first uh, trip to Afghanistan was 2004. Um, and so I was, I was in the most, uh, let's see, Eastern portion of Afghanistan, bordering Pakistan. Um, and so it was actually ironically, um, Pat Tillman, the famous football player um, who left the Arizona Cardinals to join the military as an army ranger, um, is exactly where he died. And so it was very high, high intensity, high conflict area, a lot of kinetic activity. And so that was my introduction to, to war. And so I, you know, I remember going into um into my what we called a fire base at the time. And I remember thinking, okay, now I'm here. We'll see, you know, we'll get settled up, settled in. And that night we started taking incoming rockets. And I, re I realized, you know, I might actually die in this country. Um, but it was it was something that was very interesting for me because although I was trained as a linguist and I had all these other skill sets, um, my passion was still medical. Um, and so although that, that wasn't my job in my first trip to Afghanistan, I found myself working with the special forces medics to take care of people who had been traumatized, children who had picked up a improvised explosive device and, and had a traumatic amputation, had one of their arms or legs blown off. And I found this affinity, if you will, to be able to work in that capacity. Um, and it was like my part-time job. I would do my my daytime job, if you will, you know, going out and finding the bad guys that were um, that were causing problems and instability within the country. But then I would also find ways to help out uh, with the special forces medics as a goodwill measure um, by taking care of people who have been injured. And so it was sort of this confluence of uh, me doing the job that I need to do, but me also finding more of my passion to help people that need to be helped. That is amazing and very fascinating. And I love how you tapped into uh, that opportunity to connect the dots and how you overcame your trauma to help to serve others um, because um, of having severity of trauma and not be able to heal and sometimes actually helping others help with the healing process as well. I'm, I'm blown away, um, by the way, Dr. Brendan Tony, how much uh, you accomplished and how much recognitions you have for your exceptional work from awards and medals that you were able to um, get for stepping up and doing beyond and above. And do you mind sharing from the leadership lens how this all became um, part of your day-to-day -day practice? Yeah, so, you know, the great thing about being um, in a combat zone is you're, you're forced to learn um, quickly. Um, you're, you're tested by battle, if you will. And so that's not something that many people have an opportunity to, to do. Um, and by my second combat tour, I was leading leading teams um, in Afghanistan as a as a twenty something year old. I think I was twenty four, twenty five at the time. And so um, that level of leadership, um, while under fire, if you will, um, both philo you know philosophically and practically, um, was was definitely something that allowed me to propel what I have garnered in my leadership style. 
And so um, I continued to do that. I went back to school um, and I became a, a ROTC candidate to uh, achieve a degree and then come back into the army as an officer. So as I had this sort of combat experience um, in leading troops on the battlefield, then I uh, formalized that experience in ROTC uh, while earning my undergraduate degree in psychology. Um, and, uh, and I had so many more opportunities to lead in a, in a very formalized way as an ROTC student. And then I joined the Army again as an officer. Um, and once I joined the Army as an officer, the Army did everything in its infinite wisdom to send me back to Afghanistan again. Um, but, uh, but, but, I, but at that point, now I'm in a, I have a larger sphere of influence. I have a larger impact on soldiers and in a joint environment, other airmen as well. And so that sort of just sort of to accumulate. And I went back to school to study medicine with that leadership experience behind me. I'm going to start delving into every opportunity that was afforded to me. Um, I, if there was an opportunity to take to go to a, a very remote, austere area to take care of uh, soldiers, I did that. Um, I went to flight surgeon school to learn how to take care of critically injured or critically ill patients in Army Black Hawk helicopters while in flight. Um, I, I worked at the executive level, um, working for four-star generals um, in the Indo-Pacific and Hawaii. So every unorthodox challenge that was that was you know afforded to me, I took the opportunity to uh, to make an impact. And so all of that over the years accumulated to this opportunity to um, fly from South Korea, where I was stationed at the time, to interview at the White House, which was pretty daunting. I can uh, tell you that. Um, and based on my background as a, you know, as a collected calm leader under fire, uh, my academic abilities, um, and my, I would say my humility, which is one of the things that was most important to work in that environment, um, I was selected to come and work uh, in the White House in 2018. So I worked under two administrations um, as a White House medical officer, specifically focusing on trauma. Um, and I was there supporting the president and the vice president for um, for the Trump administration. And then uh, the second half of that time, it was for the uh, for the Biden administration. And I finally retired from the army and the White House in May of 22. Wow. So for everybody watching and listening, listen to this, guys. When we have the opportunity presenting, take it and run with it. Figure it out as you go. Because what a great attitude and a mindset, Brendan. I'm, I'm just absolutely blown away because we all have chances when we figure it out like we're not ready or this might not be for me or kind of being on sidelines but what I love about your attitude was uh, I'm just going to figure it out I will take it and keep going and as a result that led you obviously ultimately to something that's for a lot of people actually uh, specifically from military side a dream come true uh, because so many people apply, so many people express interest, but they have such a rigorous background check and 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 so many things that they do uh, before they make a decision who is actually fit to to serve specifically in such a delicate capacity. So again, congratulations. But now that you retired <laughs> and still so young. Um, what is on the bucket list for you? What are you uh, hoping to continue to um, contribute your amazing talents and making tremendous impact? Yes, thank you for, for the question. Um, I have a lot of things, uh, you know, a lot of irons in a fire, if you will. Um, I've sort of transitioned, you know, if you will, from um, from a defense perspective after working in the Department of Defense and being a soldier and, and finding ways to medically protect our nation's leaders to now wanting to really dive deep into that passion to impact people who are on the lower rungs of the ladder of development in the world, if they're on the ladder of development at all. And so I guess what I'm speaking to is working in low income countries and lower middle income countries um, that have poor infrastructure, healthcare infrastructure, um, that need help with, uh, with being able to uh, build their health systems and human resources for health. Um, I wanna work in that capacity. And so um, as I've finished all this education and a doctorate and a master's degree and then two bachelor's degrees. Now I'm finishing a master's in public health at George Washington University in, in Washington, D.C. 
um, to align with my goals and initiatives to be able to impact people from a health perspective, a global health perspective. So I'm also uh, running a or a board chair of a nonprofit organization called Stepping Stones for Global Health. I'm sorry, Stepping Stones for Global Development, rather. And we are currently uh, working in, um, in Ecuador in the Galapagos Islands, and we're working with, um, with the local population there to find ways to, um, to screen for cervical cancer and treat patients who have cervical cancer. And then we plan on moving to other areas in the, in the world as well. But I'm using my skills and talents as, um, as a great leader, a great leader that has a, a track record of being very diplomatic in a lot of ways to be able to lead global health efforts around the world that feeds into our a larger, uh, a larger development uh, uh, strategic objective for many countries. That is so admirable. And <clears throat> we, we definitely see not only tremendous needs in our own country, but of course, developing countries need it more than ever because we're just experience something that uh, really affected every single one of us, uh, pandemic and then post pandemic life, right? And speaking of not only issues that are health related, but also how they're really taxing on the people's mental health, social economical status, opportunities, and so many other factors. So I just want to say that is so admirable that you are um, putting your efforts and all the knowledge and education to do greater good on the larger global scale. Uh, with programs that we're seeing, so definitely we'll make sure that people can really uh, hear and see um, a little more about Stepping Stone for Global Development and provide the link to that. But it seems like you've also been involved in the National Institute of Health. Um, and from that perspective, I'm just curious, what do you see also major issue here in the United States and a great opportunity to, to make a difference? Yeah, I think we have a lot of ways that we can make a difference. I mean, my uh, nonprofit is just one of those ways. But as you mentioned, I'm currently uh, working at the National Institutes of Health, um, working in a vascular medicine team and finding ways that um, that we we can you know find uh, diseases um, and treatments for rare diseases and being able to um, being able to impact people who otherwise don't have resources or they don't have the technical expert expertise in their areas within the United States or even abroad. You know, many of our patients come from overseas uh, where they have these ill-defined uh, or rare diseases. And so that research that we're doing at the National Institutes of Health is intramural and is extramural and is collaborative around the world. We have the largest research hospital in the entire world, and that's the National Institutes of Health. Um, so that's, that's what I'm doing primarily, but I'm also working, again, in the development space with a nonprofit, and I want to be able to bring all of that together um, to be able to be, if you will, an ambassador for the United States, to be able to be a person that can lead as a thought leader um, in different spaces um, that uh, that can impact other countries uh, around the world. And whether that's research, whether that's through programmatic intervention, um, I'm finding various different ways to do that and bringing on bringing on other stakeholders that have the same interests that I do. That is brilliant. And definitely I am already, my brain is spinning of excitement and great opportunities that we can definitely leverage and utilize your skill set. And everybody again watching and listening, please uh, reach out to Brendan uh, directly. If you have a projects or relationships that could be beneficial, because again, uh, this year specifically more than ever should be year of collaborations, as we're seeing more than ever um, a plethora of conflicts, plethora of issues. Even uh, right now, what we're witnessing in Europe um, and other parts of the world, the Middle East and also Africa, uh, developing countries are more than ever need uh, different ways of uh, operating, developing, and also integrating their resources uh, to augment some of the problems that unfortunately keeps resurfacing and affecting so many, which we can talk about also not only refugee crisis and everything else, but but this amazing experience, when you reflect on everything right now, what would be some advice for leaders? Because leaders that are, have a power and have opportunity to make good decisions, but also to engage, what would you recommend to them uh, so that they can do something that you find to be extremely effective and very important for where we're at right now as on, on, on global level. 
Well, I think, um, you know, I, I try not to speak in a very vertical way. Um, I know that everyone listening, health might not be their number one priority. It could be, it can be business, it can be sectoral development, it can be a number of different things. But I would just say from, from a general leadership perspective is to really deep dig deep into your organizations and find that talent, look in the unlikeliest of sources to be able to find where people can reach different heights and different levels of leadership within their own realm to be able to help shape your organizations. Um, what I've seen from the best leaders growing up um, as a very young soldier and a very young officer is some leaders have this talent to be able to find um, potential. And once they gave people an opportunity, it was Pandora's box. You know, they would do a number of different things um, that were, you know, oftentimes deemed well beyond their scope, you know? And so that was the case for me. I was able to impact people on multiple different levels at all points of my career because I had leaders that believed in me. Um, and their uh, belief in me made me believe in myself. It was bi-directional, it was synergistic, and I was able to move forward with a lot of initiatives that impacted people, but also myself, because I had great leadership. Um, also learned from some bad leadership as well. And so I think we need to know what not to do um, sometimes by having bad leadership. So it's not to say that if you're in an organization or a position right now where you don't feel supported, where you don't feel like you have the buffers and the resources to be able to do your job, it also is an opportunity to see once you become a leader, um, I think we all have the ability to lead in every realm that we're in in life, um, you know what not to do. And so I also appreciated those uh, leaders that were not as effective as, as some of the great leaders I had. Um, from a global health perspective um, within leadership, I say look for all the ways that you can collaborate. Just like you mentioned, um, you know, we're in a, in a space now where we are no longer in silos. The COVID-19 pandemic highlighted that um, with, with great reverence that we cannot do things at a, at a country level. We have to work in an international way, in a collaborative way. And I'm glad that the WHO is highlighting that um, because that's what we need to look at uh, moving forward. We, have for a very long time, had very vertical issues. Um, we only want to address malaria or we only want to address, um, you know, some communicable disease. But realizing that although I may be able to build a hospital in a certain area of a country that needs uh, uh, primary care, I need the roads to be able to get there, you know, and so I need someone to, I need to work with those folks that can, that can build infrastructure. I also need electricity and running water. So I need folks that, that kind of work in that space. And, you know, I also need health, health resources, um, human resources. So we need to look at how these countries and other countries are um, are building their healthcare workforce. So that speaks to education. Um, but you can't have education without uh, without making sure that people aren't you know uh, suffering on communicable diseases. So it's all interconnected. Um, all these elements of development. And so I'm able to see that nexus between all of these different sectors and bring those together to make a positive impact. That is brilliant. And I'm glad you're emphasizing on that as well, because it's amazing how quicker and how much more we can do, um, but specifically when time is of essence, like we're seeing such a horrible tragedies right now that are happening in Turkey and Afghan, I'm sorry, in Syria, but also things that has continued to happen in Afghanistan and Ukraine, for example. So we have uh, many avenues that we can insert our expertise and collaborate. And with everything you did, so much that you already accomplished, it's evident that you lived your legacy and you were leading with your legacy. And now I'm curious, um, what do you feel like that is not only in the bucket list left, but what would you like to know or accomplish to know that you accomplished specifically as a father to pass on in your children and generations to come? Did you know that you really fulfilled um, your sense of your legacy? Well, at this point in my life, again, great question. Um, I think my legacy um, starts at the very nuclear level with my family. Um, most of my career has been spent moving around the world, doing a lot of different things. I've visited probably 27 countries at this point. Um, but much of that time was spent in the absence of my children. They haven't been exposed to some of the things that we've talked about. They haven't been exposed to many of the challenges that other people um, have in this world. And so in large part, um, they live a life that I've created for them that's very comfortable. 
Um, but I want them to, um, to be able to see what challenge looks like in different parts of the world. I want to take them on some of these global health uh, engagements that I do um, around the world so they can have a, an appreciation for um, what um, underdevelopment looks like, what development looks like. And then I want them to be able to figure out how to make their impact on the world, not necessarily from a health perspective, but from their own vantage point, whatever their interest is. And so that same philosophy that I have for my children, I want to be able to reverberate that and have a ripple effect, you know, throughout my network of professionals. I want them to look deep into their resources, their expertise and their technical knowledge to figure out ways to make an impact for other people. Um, and so it's surprising that just about every industry, um, as we've seen, um, you know, as people come together to address many of these global crises, like in, uh, in Ukraine and Turkey and Syria and others, where you can see all these different elements, this whole society approach that can come together to elevate people, not just in a time of crisis, but also um, to make people better and move them up on a development scale. Um, that's my personal goal. That's my personal legacy. I've seen uh, the United States do it, for example, in COVID. You know, we had a initially a whole of government approach, and at some point it, it broadened out to a whole society approach where everyone was involved in looking out for the person next to them. Um, and so if we can do that across the waters, across international borders, um, I think that the world will be a better place. And if I can have just one slice of that pie, I've made an impact. Mm, what a beautiful, uh, again, legacy. And I don't have no doubt because everything that you already accomplished, you have tremendous legacy that speaks already for yourself. But I know, again, that you're just beginning because uh, of things you wanted to do and take it to the next level. And it's so admirable. And I love that you're going to give your children experience also to really see the third world countries or developing countries where they can have a chance uh, also to engage and others to really learn from each other. So with that in mind, in a closing what would be the last thing, just one thing, if everybody is struggling on the fence, not sure, uncertain who they want to be or what they want to do, or if they're reinventing themselves, what would be one piece of advice that can help them in those struggles? Because you continue to reinvent yourself and apply yourself so beautifully, and it would be great to get that piece of advice from you. Yeah, again, if I had to you know, put it into one box, I would say is, is lift as you climb. Um, if you're focusing on other people, uh, those people will, will propel you to your next level. Um, it's hard to be, um, you know, singularly focused on yourself and look inwardly um, and be successful. That's just my personal opinion. It may not apply to everyone, but I've had this idea that People have lifted me um, in very from very low places as I was growing up, and I've had the ability, you know, in the in the in the resources and the influence to lift other people. As long as I've been focusing on other people, I feel like, you know, without without any question, invariably, I continue to move up in life um, over time, and so that can happen at any level, um, in any environment. Lift as you climb. Is if you're focusing on other people. Uh, you'll be afforded the opportunities. That humility is so vitally important. And even within organizations, I always tell people that if you if you take care of the people, if you invest in the people, they will take care of you. And so in that way, you're lifting them up. And, and as you're climbing whatever ladder that you're in, the corporate sector, um, the development sector, whatever sector that you're in, as long as you're taking care of other people, you'll be taken care of. And that's the way I live my life. And I think that it's worked for me. And leave us positive review whenever you are listening on whatever platform there might be. Make sure your friends and family also know about the benefit and value that we provide and what we have to offer. Cheers.